Hey hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Harold Innes's idea of bias or the concept of bias. And the reason I'm doing this is because a few weeks ago I did Marshall McLuhan's notion of the medium is the message and I made some allusions there to Innes because it's really important to know what Innes was saying in order to grasp what McLuhan is saying. And I thought I'd do a little bit more on Innes uh, just to give you a better understanding of what that's about. Now before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can do that on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. You can do it on Twitter at David Guineo if you want. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in a way that makes them accessible to help you along your philosophical journey. So if you haven't already, like, share, subscribe. I'd like to see you back here. Comment. I'd like to hear from you. Reach out on any platform you find me on if you have any questions or anything. Uh, if you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. If you found this in podcast form, pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts, I should say, you can find it on YouTube where you can see the video if you're interested in that. Or if you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously good. Now, I don't want to waste any more of your time with that. Let's talk about bias for Harold Innes. Now, when it comes to understanding Innes, we're really presented with uh, a guy who wears several hats in that he was doing a lot in his life, which was a relatively short life uh, because, of, because of cancer. He did a lot in terms of political economy uh, in Canada, specifically, looking at the fur trade and cod fisheries and things like that. But he also had a very profound interest with history and looking at the Greeks especially, uh, were a, a site of fascination for him, or it's bird fascination within him. And so he had a very holistic, or tried to approach the world holistically, as one Innes expert likes to put it. And for that reason, he developed a very interesting perspective, not only on history, but on the present day situation that he was writing in, in the mid, early, mid uh, 20th century. So one of the things that he wants to emphasize is that it is a possible to arrive at a position that is somewhat untethered by dominant interpretations. So to relate to the term I just used, more holistic. So his one of his main goals was to try and challenge various biases that come to dominate people's lives, that come to dominate people's intellectual endeavors, they come to occupy various institutions, and sort of commands them in a, in a way that Innes found to be quite limiting. But before we really dive into what that is about, it's important to go through what he means by bias in a more literal way. Now what he means by bias in a more literal way is that it can manifest itself quite broadly in either a bias for space or a bias for time. So he wrote a lot about various media from papyrus to stone tablets to speech to the radio. He wrote about various media over the course of time. And each of these media essentially allow for various developments for a civilization. They do not determine that civilization because many of the things that we would come to see as being social developments actually motivate various technologies rather than technologies determining various social frameworks, but that's kind of tangential to what we're talking about here. But he demonstrated that there are various technologies that allow for more expansion over physical space, while there are other technologies that allow for more expansion across time. So, for example, a piece of paper can be easily transported, and that allowed various civilizations in history to expand much quicker, to expand far beyond their own boundaries because they could very easily communicate within their own nation, within their own civilization, and among others, which allowed for various you know, trading opportunities and so on. Any kind of explanation you want to put in there you would probably work, which allowed for expansion. Now this demonstrated for him a space bias bias for space. Now by contrast, we can have a time bias, which is a bias for time. So for example, 
in contrast to a piece of paper, you might have a stone tablet. So the stone tablet you could write on and it's gonna last a long time. That stone tablet is not gonna wear down, it's not gonna get burned or anything like that. But it was also very difficult to move. And so it restricted the actual development of a civilization physically or geographically and instead allowed them to go through time. Now, you can have one of these two biases and they compete and they struggle against one another, but that is to almost attribute to them too much value or too much autonomy, I should say. There's something else at the helm here, something else that kind of guides the logic of these various biases. And these are for him what he calls monopolies of knowledge and monopolies of power. And they argue and they fight amongst themselves essentially to attain a certain degree of force, to be able to exert some kind of force. So it is in the interest of various let's say a military organization that would be a part of a monopoly of power, it is in their interest to expand for, let's say, imperialistic reasons. So they would then advocate for these space biases, which would then reflect the various technologies that would develop. So things like the internet emerge because of, for example, the military. Now, by contrast, you would have monopolies of knowledge that might also struggle for uh, space bias. They might actually embody that to some extent, but they might also fight for a time bias because take the university, for instance, they want to exist for a very long time. We don't exactly see universities deploying their knowledge to other parts of the world. They keep it quite uh, close knit. They keep it quite hidden from public view, from, from the people of the world. And so we can maybe interpret that as being an emphasis on a longevity through time rather than an expansion through space. But this isn't to say that that's always the case. This is just to say that biases are determined by various institutions and organizations that vie for them, that fight for them, that, that try to garner some kind of power or control through these means by employing a space bias versus a time bias or vice versa. Now, these things are always in conflict for Innes. There's always a kind of dialectical encounter between the two where space bias tries to overcome time bias and time bias tries to overcome space bias. And if we ever have one more than the other, that is if there's a disequilibrium between the two, there's the risk of civilizational collapse. So. For example, if a civilization expands too far, it will be far too big for it to defend itself from invasion or to maintain all of its land. Whereas if a civilization is more interested in longevity through time, then they fail to adapt to various rapid changes in the world and they will crumble either from the inside or because they have failed to adapt, that is they have stuck with tradition or, or whatever, then they have failed to anticipate and essentially plan for possible changes that could work against them. Now he gives the example of the Greeks as being a civilization that was able to balance the two and that allowed for various philosophical scientific developments that have for him gone unrivaled and we can obviously combat that, we could obviously poke holes into that. But his point is, is a good one in that if we fail to acknowledge that there are these two possibilities, and if one overtakes the other, we will certainly meet our demise, we could then begin to kind of interrogate the various biases that we exist in today or that permeate today that push us in one or the other direction so as to avoid this collapse, this possible destruction. Now, in order to do this, he thought it necessary to assume a kind of outsider perspective. Now, and I'm not entirely clear if this is something for him that you can just do, or if it happens by virtue of your being ostracized, like it's not of your own volition. And it is only in that moment that you can then, you know, assume this role of the outsider that can then, from the outside looking in, identify various biases, various structures, various ways of living, 
organizational modes that aren't natural, they aren't the way that everyone does things, but they are rather uh, meant to serve various interests. But when we exist within a system, it is very difficult for us to actually identify them. It is very difficult for us to be able to look at the whole picture and see all of the various machinations, all of the various movements of the system at hand that keep it going at that, and that maintain certain interests. So one of the things that he was critical about was the university and a kind of uncritical acceptance of expert knowledge as though there's no other way to do it. We are just meant to step in line to whatever uh, an expert might say and not think about it at all. He was totally dissatisfied with that because that only happens because of a certain kind of logic, a certain kind of bias that places emphasis on certain types of knowledge, certain types of people that are that ha that have been bestowed a kind of cultural value. So one of the things that he says at the end of, I believe, one of his short essays titled Minerva's, Minerva's Owl, he says that it is imperative that we cease to you know keep looking back in time to find like knowledge in the past, which is just an emphasis on, on time bias. And instead we begin to look at what is going on in the present. And we begin to look at what of these various biases we are constantly being confronted with and that actually pose a threat to our uh, existence. And that is more or less it. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that as far as understanding the entirety of Innes's project and his approach to bias. But I think that it might serve as a decent introduction to anyone who's interested in Innes's work. And he's kind of, I don't know if he's read all that much, but anyways, yeah, if you like what I did here, like, share, subscribe. If you didn't, there's a dislike button. You can yell at me in the comments or whatever. If you're listening to this in Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review. I see them, I read them. Uh, and five stars if you like what I did, that would help me out a lot. And yeah, catch you next time.